Since some other videos, we've taken a look at how melting occurs at continental rifts and mantle plumes. So if we have temperature increasing to the right and pressure increasing downwards, we might imagine a mantle solidus that looks like this. And we can draw a geotherm. A typical geotherm might look something like this. So in this diagram, it has kind of a shallow slope where heat is being transferred by conduction, and then a very, very steep slope where you have heat being transferred by convection. So we've got here the lithosphere, and then below the lithosphere is the convective mantle. So where the convective mantle is in this diagram, the geotherm is very steep, very small change uh, in temperature for a given depth. And then for the lithosphere, heat is being transferred by conduction rather than convection. And the, and the thermal change is quite a bit more dramatic. Well, in the case of a mid-ocean ridge, we allowed the lithosphere here, this thickness, to thin. And so if we let the lithosphere become much thinner, then this hot material could rise to a shallower depth so that it would exceed the solidus and then give us a zone of partial melting. In the case of a mantle plume, we simply had a hotter geotherm. So we'd have a geotherm that would, so this is geotherm one that's rooted in the shallow mantle. We might have a second geotherm, a geotherm two that's rooted at the core mantle boundary. It would rise up at the same rate. Both of these are following a so-called adiabatic path, which again is defined in another video, uh, but that hotter geotherm can now cross the solidus and allow for partial melting where the, the um, the colder geotherm would not. But in the case of a subduction zone, we don't have either one of those scenarios. Let's take a look at what's happening at a subduction zone. We would have a piece of lithosphere, oceanic lithosphere, that is shown here being subducted beneath, let's say, some continental crust. Could be oceanic, doesn't really matter. Let's just put in some thick continental crust here. And as this oceanic lithosphere subsides, it's going to carry down some sediments, and those sediments in some of the mantle itself may shed off water. So where's that water going to come from? First, let's take a look at what's happening in the subduction zone itself, um, or even before we reach the subduction zone. So here is the oceanic um, well, the ocean basins, the water. And we have that water being circulated through the oceanic crust and maybe even to the, into the mantle as well, converting the mantle peridotite. So peridotite, when it interacts with water, can turn into serpentinite. So that's a very rich, uh, water-rich kind of rock made of a mineral called serpentine. Uh, there are also sediments that are going to collect down here at the bottom of the ocean floor, and some of those sediments are going to be very rich in water. So sediments in this hydrated basalt and hydrated mantle is going to make it down into the mantle in a subduction zone. So as this stuff sinks downwards, when it reaches a high enough pressure, some of that water may be driven off into the mantle. So we have a mantle here. Uh, it's made of peridotite over here, and it's made of peridotite over here but this peridotite is dry, whereas this peridotite is wet. And that's really the key difference. So we've got a lot of peridotite in this area here that we refer to as the mantle wedge. Let's throw another term at you. The mantle wedge is this wedge of mantle that's stuck between the overlying crust and the subducted lithosphere. And that mantle wedge will be hydrated. It's going to have water input from sediments and hydrated basalt and uh, other hydrated materials like serpentinite. They're going to dehydrate when they reach these very high pressures. That water will quite literally be squeezed out of the rocks and add water to give us a wet peridotite here compared to the dry peridotite we would expect underneath a mid-ocean ridge. So what does that mean in terms of the TP diagram that we've drawn before. So let's draw this same diagram, temperature increasing to the right, pressure increasing downwards. Here's the typical mantle solidus. 
So we'll label that the solidus. But when we write the solidus in this and other diagrams, it's not just any solidus. It's the dry mantle solidus. If we take peridotite, a uh, typical mantle rock, if it has no water at all, then that would be its melting temperature. And then let's draw the geotherm in here, as we've drawn it in the past, where it's at a cold enough temperature where we would not ordinarily have the geotherm at any point hotter than the mantles. Here, excuse me, hotter than the solidus. Notice that here the dry solidus is everywhere at a temperature that is hotter than the actual geotherm. So the geotherm is not hot enough to melt. However, if we add water to the mantle, if we have a wet peridotite instead of a dry peridotite, then its new solidus would look something like this. So what we're drawing, drawing here is the wet peridotite solidus. So this solidus is fixed for a fixed composition. If we change the composition by adding water, uh, then we allow melting to occur at much lower temperatures than it ordinarily would. And so here, the geotherm is above the wet solidus in this region. So the geotherm is below the dry solidus, but when we add water into the subduction zone, into the mantle wedge, that mantle, wet, that mantle wedge now has a new composition. It is a wet peridotite with a much lower melting temperature. And so now we have this melting region that can now drive volcanic activity at the surface, the kind of volcanic activity that we would see at the Cascades or in the Andes, or that make up the islands of Japan or many other islands in the, uh, in the Pacific Ocean.